It's very clear that uh, Sony is in the pirate spirits. Yes, they are in, the, in a pirate mood, seeing that Sea of Thieves are dominating their pre-order sales massively. <laughs> Yes, they are really feeling like pirates because they cannot believe that ponies are going to pay $70 for Rise of Ronin. Yes, $70 USD for Rise of Ronin. You see, normally Sony would leave the creme de la creme of gaming for $70. We know the God of War and the uh, Spider-Man and the Horizons. They would leave those type of AAA games and they will sell that for $70. But we know that they tend to push the envelope to see how much they can milk the PlayStation community. They would have done it with the PlayStation VR 2, putting out that peripheral and not even supporting it. They would have done it with the PlayStation Vita, putting out that uh, system and not supporting it with first party game. And they recently had huge success with the PlayStation Portal. So Sony keep pushing the envelope of being pirates um so now they are doing it with rise of ruining putting out this ps3 looking game and saying it's 70 dollars <laughs> what the ponies bite we'll have to wait and see but it's very clear that this game the rise of ruining is not a triple a game this game is looking for the best a playstation 3 game and it's not just me capping it's all over look at this clip here that is all over twitter where fanboys are angry that this game really looks like a playstation 3 game then after you you will look at some of the images and you would see how those images look as well look at this guys does this scream a next generation does this scream uh the fastest ssd known to man faster than flash faster than this than the speed force look at this <laughs> sony i think you caught them again man i think you got those ponies again another one in the back sony <laughs> but we're not here to talk about that today guys we are here to talk about a recent interview that um you know went on with um cnbc and sony you see cnbc would have asked the question could sony still stay on top for the coming generations we'll really have to ask that question so we'll you know react to this particular video we will discuss it and we'll look at some of the points that i mean let's clear up any sort of lies that occurs but let's see how good of a job cnbc does interviewing all the executives there at sony you know what let's get it this is a sickness let's get it now this video is brought to you by the let's get it podcast this podcast would be a podcast that i would be hosting um very soon maybe the ending of the month or early in april i'm looking to see if i can get everything so that i could um you know have this podcast it would be on a sunday and also we would have you know some cool some cool interaction with of course those who are listening so if you want to help me out uh with my rig that i'm building feel free to look at my paypal i'll have it um pin as a pin comment look at that paypal and see if it is you can contribute whatever you feel like contributing if you don't have anything to contribute no problem just you being here um liking subscribing commenting is enough so thank you so much to all those who would have contributed um already and um you know i look forward to the podcast so thanks again and let's get back to the video. From Spider-Man to God of War and Final Fantasy, it's been 30 years since the PlayStation first brought to life some of the most iconic video game franchises. So yes, Sony is known for this style of gaming, the, you know, cinematic, uh, single-player, narrative-driven game. Um, this is the type of game that Sony would charge $70 for. So, um, having them release Rise of Ronin and saying that it's the same price for the games that they are known for is a really kick to the face. This game, Rise of Ronin, is really looking like Ashi Larry. Ashi Larry. <laughs> Why 
Why do they call him Ashley Larry? Well, there's your man. Ashley Larry, Marcy Projects, Marcy son, what? <laughs> <laughs> and they are going to try to convince their consumer base that it's worth, um, you know, seven dollars. What a shame. Whether it's coming from third party partners that release stuff that is exclusive to their platform or their own first party studios making stuff, the library has been the number one thing that really pushes the success of the systems. For PlayStation, the game has always been, no pun intended, great content to a great console. And here is where I disagree with both Kevin and Carolina. You see, the PlayStation of old we used to drive console sales with their exclusives, um, both first party and third party. But the PlayStation that we have today, their console sales are primarily driven not by the first party content, but by the mind share of the previous generation. The majority of games being bought for the PlayStation uh, platform is not the first party, but multi-platform games, right? The multi-plats, the Maddens, the Call of Duty, the Fortnite, the Roblox. Those are the games that are being played most on a PlayStation platform, not the first party. So um, back in the day, yes, first party and third party exclusive titles were king, but today, uh, because Sony has the mind share, that is why they are seeing success when it comes to the multi-platform games. And I think that that is where the exclusivity brings people and creates a loyalty and engagement that is really hard to replicate. During its pandemic era rollout, the PlayStation 5 was nearly impossible to come by. Hunting for a new PlayStation for Christmas or an Xbox Series, Series 10? Good luck. Sony's always done great hardware design. Wait, wait, wait. Let me just clear something up. The main reason why the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 was hard to get during that time was because of the chip shortage and scalpers. Yes, putting those two together made it very difficult uh, to get one of those consoles. Wait, the Jimran just said that the PlayStation 5 had a masterful design. <laughs> Jim, don't do me that. Don't do me that. You and I know that that PlayStation 5 is too big and it's too clumsy. You know that. Come on. We can be honest here. You're leaving after all. You, you have no need to cap for Sony again. And then the revision, the slim consoles, you all gave all your consumers toothpicks to hold that up. Come on. <laughs> and it's one of our strengths. It's one of our points of difference. The PlayStation 2 is the best-selling video game console of all time, with nearly triple the sales of Sony's latest PlayStation 5. Annual gaming sales exceeded $24 billion for Sony in fiscal year 2022, which makes up over 30% of the company's overall revenue. The PlayStation Network, the company's online gaming platform, has 123 million active monthly users. For reference, that's about the same number of people who tuned in for the record-breaking Super Bowl 58. If you include mobile, you include global, you put it all together, the video game industry is a $200 billion plus industry. It's bigger than music, it's bigger than movies. On a revenue basis, the largest entertainment sector in the world. So yes, according to what Sean Layden just said there, the gaming industry is very big. Well, let me just say this one point. One of the main reasons for the PlayStation 2 success is that the PlayStation 2 had a built-in DVD. A lot of persons, um, you know, underestimate how popular um, DVDs were back then and how persons are getting two, uh, you know, two functions in one, a DVD and a game console. And that is what drove, you know, a lot of the, of the sales. I don't have the data and statistics, but I know it's a lot. At this point in time, let's take a break, a rise of Ronin break. And this rise of Ronin break is brought to you by the subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. Now I want you guys to look at this horse riding um, animation here. Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? Is this horse constipated? Does this horse need a laxative? Look how this horse is running. What's going on here? Are you guys saying that this is a PlayStation 5? <laughs> Just looking at this footage right here, like this, this does not remotely stack up to what Ghost of Tsushima looked like.
The Nintendo Home Entertainment System entered Japanese homes in 1984 before spreading internationally two years later. It utilized game cartridges that were inserted directly into the device, a standard for that decade's gaming consoles. You mean you haven't played it yet? We can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. In 1994, the PlayStation launched in Japan, which accelerated the gaming industry's shift away from cartridges. Going over to a disc format was a big deal because of how much data could be stored on those discs versus what was you know, possible on cartridges at the time. And that was a large reason why a lot of third-party studios even moved over to PlayStation. While competitors in the modern video game landscape, Sony and Nintendo had privately signed an agreement in 1988 to jointly develop an optical disc game player. There were even 200 Nintendo PlayStation prototypes that were manufactured, but the relationship fell apart before its release. Just when we were about to announce the launch of this, Nintendo backed away and they ended up going with Philips for their optical disc format. And Sony was kind of left at the altar, standing here with this beautiful compact disc reader. And so the PlayStation was born. So yes, a lot of persons don't know that little game in history that um, basically, Nintendo is a PlayStation father. If Nintendo did not do what they did, there would have been no PlayStation. The, so the reason why PlayStation exists today, it is because of Nintendo. Wow, no wonder why Nintendo beats Sony coming and going because Nintendo has been around so long that they know what consumers want. That is why we are seeing Nintendo beating the stuffing out of Sony, no matter what Sony does. Sony's first foray into the video game space entered the US in a 1995 launch that was announced at the first Electronic Entertainment Expo, known as E3. Sega, one of Sony's biggest competitors at the time, also announced its US release of its Saturn console with a price point of $399. Before the launch, there was considerable uncertainty. We were moving into a space that uh, had two pretty entrenched uh, occupants, Nintendo and Sega. The then president of Sony Computer Entertainment America took the E3 stage and made a short but significant announcement. $299. <laughs> <laughs> So you all see exactly what Sony and the executives did even back then with that toxic behavior. But that is besides the point. What Sony loves to do is wait until the other companies make a move. And then what they do is try to undermine the move that their competitors, um, you know, do. This even happened in the Xbox One PlayStation 4 uh, generation when they realized that the DRM was not um, something received well by the customers and also Microsoft price. All they did was undercut that and took out the DRM. And because of that, um, that is how they were able to have a very good um, start for the PlayStation 4 generation. Price of the PlayStation launching in the US. That was throwing the gauntlet down. It's like PlayStation's not here to play. We're here to win and we're gonna come in $100 under all of you. But it just blew the, blew the doors off and people thought, wow, Sony's not here to dip their toes in the water. They're jumping all in. But there was no way that we could assume that we were gonna be successful. And it was really not until the day of launch, you know, we woke up that morning and we saw big queues outside retailers uh, of excited people waiting to get their hands on, on their PlayStation that we realized that we were probably onto something there. The original PlayStation went on to sell over 100 million units worldwide. Jim Ryan joined Sony in 1994, the same year that the PlayStation was born in Japan. He is set to retire in March of 2024 after a 30-year tenure with the company. Look at Jim Ryan all happy here, man. Oh, Jim Ryan, you lion, Ryan, lion, you. <laughs> the same guy who is leaving and making sure he cashes out his money. Yep, he knew what was going to happen. He knew the backlash that Sony was going to take after they fired all those workers you all you jim ryan lion lion you <laughs> i have hugely fond memories of the original playstation and uh, i'd never really played too many games before joining what was then sony computer entertainment putting cd discs to that thing and really experiencing tekken experiencing ridge racer uh, experiencing resident evil those were great days from the beginning the company knew just being a tech company wasn't enough you had to bring some secret sauce in for the entertainment world. And by doing a joint venture between Sony Music and Sony Electronics, I think that was the key to the early success of PlayStation. 
The PS2 was released in 2000 and went on to become the best-selling video game console of all time, selling a total of over 155 million consoles. We went into to markets where video gaming had never really been a thing. So, you know, Southern Europe, for example, Italy and Spain, and places like the Middle East, we established a gaming culture where, where none had existed. The PS2 also functioned as an affordable home entertainment system as it had a built-in DVD player. This helped some buyers justify the purchase as DVD sales reached $16.3 billion and accounted for more than half of the U.S. home video market by 2005. We put like The Matrix into a box with a PS2 that you don't like games but you want to watch this movie and it was, DVD was a real accelerant for the PlayStation 2 adoption. But this momentum came to a halt when Sony released the PlayStation 3 in 2006. Our Icarus moment was when we launched the PlayStation 3. We created a huge hole in the bottom line that we need to fill over time. The machine was incredibly expensive. I just remember anecdotally getting that sticker shock when you guys announced the price of the PlayStation 3. Oh my God, who's gonna buy this? This is ridiculous. At the time, now today, that kind of is a normal console price, I guess. Can you just talk a little bit about the challenges in that generation that you guys went through? Yeah, I, I think if I had to kind of um, encapsulate PlayStation 3 generation, I, th I think I'd sort of say that we maybe we got a bit carried away with the success that we'd been enjoying on PlayStation 2, and we, we kind of stumbled a little bit at the start of that generation. And the Come on, Jimbo. Come on, Jimmy boy. It wasn't just being carried away. You guys were arrogant. You guys were haughty. You guys thought that the stable money was not smelling like, like real money. That is why you guys are telling your consumer base to work more hours and get two jobs in order to afford the PlayStation 3. This was the arrogance of Sony uh, back then and it has traveled even today, that arrogance. The early days were difficult. It was very, very powerful, but it was also very expensive and it was frankly hard to develop for. We needed to work really hard with some, some amazing franchises. The company slashed prices multiple times for the PS3, but still lagged behind Microsoft's Xbox 360 and Nintendo's Wii. The company picked itself up, brushed itself off, came up with some of the most amazing games of the generation. Uncharted began on PS3, Killzone was on PS3, Resistance was on PS3, and knew that we had to win out by not being a computer in your living room, but by being a game machine in your house. The 2013 launch of the PlayStation 4 proved to be the hit Sony needed after the slump in sales from its predecessor. It launched at a lower price than the PS3 and Sony saw its fastest start in console sales up to this point. In the years that followed, Sony went on to sell double the amount of PS4 consoles compared to the Xbox One. I was playing a fair bit of FIFA back then because the uh, you know, power of the PlayStation 4 allowed um, sports games, in particular soccer, um, that as a European, um, I'm crazy about uh, to become really realistic and uh, you know really great gaming experience. I think PlayStation's success is really rooted at the core of what they do best, which is content. And you know, in the industry, we always say content is king, and it's true. There's this trend where gamers play they spent more time in fewer blockbuster games. So what that means for us as game makers is we're making these benchmark titles and they're, they're big bets, they're big budgets, and that comes with a lot of risk. The PlayStation content library is composed of first-party and third-party developed games, meaning it's a mix of games created in-house at PlayStation Studios and by outside developers. The PlayStation depended on third-party developers and publishers to bring content in. We built a platform we built some software, but the majority of the opportunity was, sp was spread against Electronic Arts, Activision, Ubisoft, Namco, Capcom. Sony was happy not to be the biggest publisher on the platform as long as they could increase it. it come on, Sean, come on, Sean. You and I know that Sony wanted a bigger piece of the pie of the industry. If Sony had the money to do it, they would have. Let's not play the fool. It's not to say that if Sony didn't have the money, they would say no, leave things as it were. But you guys are broke. I make nothing. Zero. Zilch. By the time I pay all my scientists, all my people in my, in my research department, lab coats, it's a wash. Well, why you do it then, baby Billy? Well, because I'm selfless.
It wasn't about taking shares of the pie, it was about making the pie itself bigger. And I think that was a difference of approach that um, helped the company to be successful. But a slice of that pie was taken off the table in 2023 when Microsoft completed its purchase of the video game giant Activision Blizzard. Well, we were concerned about what the regulatory climate would be, but we never thought that there was any you know, real reason that was legitimate why these two companies couldn't combine. The big controversy is obviously Activision is, is a big producer of games and the concern was that with Microsoft acquiring them, they would own pretty much what is left of independent big studios and not share the games over with PlayStation. You had this interesting argument about Microsoft buying Activision and what that could mean for exclusives, what that could mean for cloud streaming. At the same time, Sony has done very similar things, buying studios to make them exclusive or making exclusive deals with companies like Square. In your view, why was the Activision deal wrong or bad for the industry? Hey, that was a very good question, dear journalists. That was a very, very good question. Hey, Win for you, win for this journalist, W for you. Very, very good question. Let's hear how Jim Ryan slid us away from this uh, question here. He's a snake, you know, you guys do that, right? <laughs> Let's see how we slip and slide away from this question. Yeah, the, the, the reason that we felt this one was, was different um, to anything that had happened in the past was the sheer size uh, and importance of the Call of Duty franchise. Uh, so we were absolutely thrilled to be able to negotiate a deal with Microsoft to ensure that that franchise remains available on PlayStation platforms for the next 10 years. And that was very important to us. We were very happy to have done that deal. But the timeline is a little different though, right? Because why didn't you agree to the deal when it was first offered? And instead you were part of the case with the FTC, a, a key witness for the FTC. Wow. That is journalism. I really have to give this uh, journalist a round of applause. He's doing a, a very good job asking the correct questions. Yeah, I, you, you know, we're, we're at risk of getting very granular here, but there, there are deals and deals. Um, and uh, you, you know, the deal that was offered at a certain point of time may not have been the deal that was actually signed. Microsoft's Activision acquisition was by far the most expensive in industry history and more than double Microsoft's second largest acquisition of its 2016 purchase of LinkedIn. I see the consolidation in the industry. I see people like Microsoft or Embracer or some groups out of Saudi Arabia buying up a bunch of studios. And I see consolidation to be the enemy of creativity. If we've commoditized the, the product, you're just going to get more of the same. But throughout its time in the gaming industry, Sony itself has also acquired more than a dozen game development studios. And many of these studios have gone on to produce some of its biggest hits. And don't forget this journalist that some of these studios that uh, Sony acquired are dead. Yes, we're talking about six feet under with worms and the whole shebang, dead. Insomniac Games was behind the PlayStation 5's record-breaking success with Spider-Man 2 in 2023. And now, the way these games are being played is also evolving. Over the past decade, Sony's game revenue has shifted overwhelmingly from physical discs to digital downloads. And this is what we were trying to tell the ponies that the reason why some of the game stores are not carrying physical discs is because the majority of sales are, um, you know, are soft copy. In addition to that, um, there's a reason why Microsoft um, does not chat as well on the NPD because the majority of their games are being sold digitally. So when these guys are making a victory lap, it's very clear that physical media is dying and they, it is going digital. Both Xbox and PlayStation began introducing entirely disc-free consoles with the Xbox Series S and the PlayStation 5 in 2020. Both companies are also improving their ability for users to stream games directly from the cloud. 
Both Sony and Microsoft utilize in-house servers for streaming games. For Microsoft, the advantage of doing that is that they own Azure and, you know, in, in that respect, obviously their cost to deliver that experience is going to be lower. Microsoft controls 60 to 70 percent of the overall cloud gaming market. PlayStation Plus has about 8 million subscribers to its premium tier that allows users to stream from the cloud. That's about 17% of its users that pay for its subscription gaming service. However, right now, cloud gaming accounts for a small part of the overall gaming market. Cloud-enabled gaming generated just over $5 billion in revenue in 2022, which pales in comparison to the $35 billion in console game sales. I've lost count of the number of times uh, over very many years that people have said the era of the console is over. Cloud will, will emerge and it will, uh, over time, uh, become a significant component of the way that people uh, enjoy interactive entertainment. Uh, but it's not there yet. This is why the Sony community, all they do is lie. Because I recall Jim Ryan telling the CMA that he's happy that they blocked the Activision Blizzard merger. Um, although the reason why the CMA did it was because of cloud gaming. Now Jim Ryan is sitting here in this, um, in this interview and saying that cloud gaming is no threat. Cloud gaming is not ready. Um, so then why did you agree with the CMA to say that here what um, it's okay to block Microsoft because of cloud? We got him guys, we got him. Especially considering that the telecommunications infrastructure needed for smooth gameplay is just not strong enough in much of the world, including certain parts of the US. The fact that there is a rural broadband initiative in the federal government indicates that rural broadband needs work. This inequality in internet connectivity can also lead to delays in digital downloads, indicating the modern relevance of physical discs for both PlayStation and Xbox. And oftentimes when people talk about things like console wars and exclusivity and that kind of thing, they really compare PlayStation and Xbox more directly. Nintendo doesn't get talked about in the same breath as often. I feel like people kind of just let Nintendo be its own thing. Yet Nintendo Switch is the second best-selling video game console of all time behind the PS2. I think that maybe the mobility aspect of it and because it's a handheld, people think about it differently, almost more competing against a phone than not a console, but it is a console. If you think about what PlayStation has done now with a handheld that you can pair with your PS5 and be able to you know, move around the home, it kind of shows that they see Nintendo as a competitor. Shortly before Christmas, we launched PlayStation Portal, which is a device that allows people to use our remote play functionality to enjoy PS5 gaming experiences in a handheld environment. In more recent years, there has also been an increase in leveraging the iconic PlayStation content outside the gaming space. I'm really pleased about the early successes of, of PlayStation productions working with Sony Pictures. We've taken some of our best IP and converted that to, uh, to movies with Uncharted, to uh, the TV format with The Last of Us. I think what really impressed them was the fact that it didn't turn into a monster. And Sony plans to keep increasing the intellectual property within its systems. By 2025, the company says it expects to be putting 50% of its investment into new IP. That compares to just 20% back in 2019. It's an important piece to kind of cement that, uh, that idea that, that games are part of uh, the pop culture now and we reach broader audiences every time. Quality in, in the adaptations is just as important to, as in quality of the games that we make. So yes, Sony would do good with the movies. I mean, um, they already make games that are very similar with the movies. So that transition from game to movie should be very easy for them because most of their first party games are like movies anyway. And this is what they need to do because they are broke. They need to go into the movies because right now they ain't looking good financially. But the gaming industry is facing some headwinds. Thousands of jobs were cut in the gaming industry in 2024, and last month Sony laid off 900 workers from its PlayStation division, or 8% of the unit's global workforce. So I think I'll stop the video here. Let me hear what you think about this um, CNBC uh, piece when it comes to Sony. I mean, the journalist did well. I agree with most of his points and I love his questioning. Now, would Sony stay on top uh, for the next generation? 
we'll have to wait and see because as we know microsoft in plain they are coming out with the biggest generational leap when it comes to console they are firing on all cylinders when it comes to their games their first party studios are now starting to cook but let me hear what you think about everything that was said um, in this video um, don't forget to like and subscribe guys thank you thank you thank you again for the support and i will see you guys in the next one later